Welcome to a TBN Town Hall special, The State of the Nation 2024. I'm Eric Stackelbeck. Let's start with the question. As we move into this new year, do you feel a sense of optimism about where our nation is heading? Or do you feel dread when you consider what the next 12 months will bring, including what promises to be a very contentious presidential election? Polls show that more Americans are pessimistic about our country's future now than ever before. And they're concerned that for their kids and grandkids, the American dream is gone. A growing number of Americans feel that our country is hopelessly divided from Capitol Hill to social media to our nation's schools. On one side are those who want to preserve America's Judeo-Christian heritage and the vision of our founders. On the other are those who want to transform America into a secular woke nation that our founders wouldn't even recognize. From rampant crime to wide open borders, from cancel culture to transgenderism and a growing hostility to biblical values, our nation is at a crossroads and all while storms gather in the Middle East, Russia, China, and beyond. So which way will we choose? The 2024 election will likely be a very good indicator. Are America's best days behind her? Has the die already been cast? Or can God use this nation in a mighty way once again? And what role can Christians play in a national revival? Over the next hour, I'll be joined by an all-star panel to discuss the hot button issues that will affect all of our lives in 2024. But first, let's welcome Sage Steele, podcaster, public speaker, and former ESPN anchor. Sage, welcome, great to have you. Kirk Cameron, filmmaker, author, and host of Takeaways right here on TBN. Kirk, always great to see you. Samuel Rodriguez, pastor, producer, author, and evangelist. Pastor Sam, great to see you as always. And Johnny Moore, president of the Congress of Christian Leaders and a former presidential appointee to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Johnny, welcome. It's great to have you all with us. It's going to be a great conversation. We've got an hour, but up first, we're going to start with a hot button subject that many of our viewers have expressed great concern about, cancel culture and the shutdown of conservative and Christian viewpoints. Take a look. The Young Americans for Freedom is hosting Ben Shapiro live on the UW campus where protests are now underway. Both sides seem to be fighting over free speech and what is allowed to be said and should be said here. This is such a topic of great concern for our viewers. Sage Steele, I want to start with you. Number one, ladies first. And <laughs> number guys. two, hey, you have personal experience with cancel culture, obviously an anchor at ESPN for 16 years. On your way out, you had some difficulties there because you expressed a conservative view. Talk about why this cancel culture trend is personal for you and so alarming for our country. I struggle to, but I think, um... I think what I've learned over the past five or six years since my first cancellation, because there have been many, is that the more you talk about it, the more uh, people realize it is an issue, and then maybe to try to prevent it, which I don't know that it's fully possible. We can't control each other's minds, our thought processes. But um, listen, I, I thought I was being me, which is what we're encouraged to do, right? Especially on social media, et cetera. Be you, be proud. And I, I was just speaking about my own um, experiences as a, a woman in a man's world, uh, sports for almost 30 years as a sportscaster, um, as a biracial woman. I have a white mother and a black father, and I feel like I have the best, most diverse upbringing. Um, and, and just so people know, Sage, not to cut you off, yeah. but basically you questioned the COVID vaccine mandate mm -hmm. at Disney ESPN, your employer. And you questioned some comments by Barack Obama. He identifies himself as black. And you said, hey, what about his white mother and grandmother? And you, being biracial, have a little something to say about that. And for that, you were castigated by your employer. I was. And I think that's, that's the problem, is when you're told that it's OK to be you, to be yourself, and then you're told, well, wait a minute, not that, not that part. So what I, what, maybe these employers, corporate America in particular, just give me a list what I'm allowed to say, what I'm not supposed to say, and the timing seems to matter too. 
Um, listen, it had happened for years and years. And again, I, I knew where I was working. I knew who my employers were at that time. But it really reached a, a really fever pitch, I think, um, 2020, pandemic, George Floyd, racial tensions across the country. Uh, but at my network in particular, many people were speaking out on the live platforms, right, about their opinions on race relations, their opinions on the, the vaccine mandate, et cetera, yeah. castigating people who didn't, who were hesitant about getting the vaccine, but then in my case had no choice in order to keep your job. So I express some of mine on, a, on an off day, on a separate podcast, no ESPN platforms. And since I didn't go along with the narrative, um, I was silenced, suspended from my job, uh, forced to apologize, events taken away, shut down. That was kind of the end of many years of it kind of building to that point. And I just had to take a stand and say, for me, enough. I can't do this anymore and stay silent based on what you're preaching. And so to me, about the biracial part and about Barack Obama, it was simply, I was told that I wasn't black enough. Wow. I was told that I, I didn't fit into the culture enough to be a voice on my network with other people of color. And Very interesting. To me, I'm like no, that now. Yeah, your dad was the first black football player at West Point, a barrier breaker, but very interesting, Sage. And by the way, you don't have to worry about minding your tongue here. This is an open <laughs> forum here in this town hall. Uh, Kirk Cameron, coming to us from sunny California. Look, you've got a lot of experience, obviously, in Hollywood. Some would say that's kind of the land of cancel culture in some mm. ways. In your experience, look, you wrote a children's book recently uh, based on biblical values, and you try to just simply read it at public libraries across America, and in many of those libraries, you were denied. This seems like the epitome of cancel culture. Cancel culture, which is ironic, right? Because these are the same libraries that held drag queen story hours for children. So if I had come in fishnet stockings and heels and a wig, I probably would have been welcomed with open arms. I never looked good in a skirt, so <laughs> I came like this, reading about love, kindness, gentleness, and faith. And they said no, and the reasoning was, uh, again, so ironic because it was, well, um, our messaging doesn't align with yours. And if we step back and say, wait, I thought the messaging was diversity, equity, and inclusion, why are you creating a monoculture with one narrative? You're excluding me, and this is very unequal treatment, because why? I'm a Christian? Well, well, this is viewpoint discrimination of the worst kind because it involves religious discrimination, and in America, that is uh, rule number one, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. So um, what I discovered, though, which was exciting, is that, um, there are millions of people across the nation, parents, grandparents, uh, teachers, and librarians who agree with the values that are represented right here, but they feel silenced, marginalized, and canceled as citizens. They don't even have a public microphone and they feel silenced. In fact, it's worse than that. They're now learning how to silence themselves and cancel themselves so that they don't get castigated by a family member or a friend. And so th this is really reaching a fever pitch. And uh, I think we live at a very exciting um, turning point that Agreed. I believe is right around the corner. Uh, Agreed, Kirk. And Pastor Sam, look, you deal with this from the pulpit, obviously, <laughs> weekly. And you are a bold voice for biblical truth. You always have been. Do you sense now, not that it affects you and your message, but do you sense more pressure from certain quarters that, hey, you can't say that. That's just too biblical. Do you sense that becoming a trend, maybe even in the church in some quarters? Now, I, I'm a pastor in California, in <laughs> Sacramento, which is officially the cuckoo for Cocoa Puff capital of the world. <laughs> and I'm there. So is there pressure? Absolutely. Because the pushback, it's political. Uh, it could be some sort of religious persecution. Uh, you have protesters. It's a different animal in California. With that being said, cancel culture is not a political teaching. It is a religious ideology from the church of secular totalitarianism. Mm. It's a secular religious worldview that believes in perpetual cancellation that leads to condemnation. I believe in cancel culture, but not that one. It's the cancellation of our sins through the vicarious atoning finished work of Christ. Mm. So we can't be silent. If we are silent, I've written about this extensively, today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. If we are complacent as pastors, as Christians, as parents, that complacency will lead to captivity. We can't be silent in, in the face of cancel culture. 
And a big part of this, mm -hmm. Pastor Sam, is education. And Johnny, I want to talk to you about this as well. When we, when we speak about people speaking their minds, you've actually been castigated directly by the Chinese Communist Party for your advocacy on behalf of religious freedom and human rights. We're going to talk about that, Johnny, after this clip on education or indoctrination and where we are right now in America. Take a look. They've destroyed the reputations of schools like Harvard, MIT, Columbia, indoctrinated our youth and brought censorship and anti-Semitism to our campuses. The situation in our nation's schools, Johnny, I mean, you, and you're such a world traveler. You just got back from Israel, by the way, and you're coming in here to Nashville. We're so glad you're joining us. But you've seen the climate around the world when it comes to indoctrination. You have spent so much time exposing totalitarian regimes which control their education systems. Considering that, considering your literal real-world experience, are you troubled by the trends you see in America's not only at the university level, obviously, where we have pro-Hamas rallies, but even at the high school, even at the elementary school level. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about cancel culture here and you see these images and you describe your experience, for me, I see the, the Marxist struggle sessions of a generation ago. I see the, the efforts by the Chinese Communist Party with, within China and all of those countries around the world that they, that they influence to make sure to guarantee that you will, whether you believe it or not, say certain things in order that you may be subject to their power, because that's what this is actually about. It, it doesn't have anything to do with ideas. It has everything to do with power and control. And the one place this should not happen is in the United States of America. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that there are many more of us than there are of them. And especially as Christians, you know, the, the Bible tells us, like, if we cared about the opinions of people, we can't be servants of Jesus. If we just raise our voices collectively, you know, that alone, hundreds and hundreds of millions of Christians around the world would push this back because it is far more than about the power of a few people. It is about a free ideology based on a Judeo-Christian foundation against a Marxist ideology that has at every moment in history resulted in the most grotesque persecution, yes. not only of Christians, but everyone who doesn't believe. Uh, so true, Johnny. And anyone feel free to jump in. Can, but can I real quick yeah, say? Yeah, sure, Because Sage. I agree. Yeah. I do believe we are the majority, right? The most yeah. people that I talk to in middle America or anywhere, it's like, yes, just, just let me live my life. You live yours, we'll be respectful, don't have to agree. Yeah. But the fear has taken over. And I understand why. I'm just one tiny little example of why people do stay silent because you get canceled. And people have mortgages to pay and, and mouths to feed. And so I, I think the fear is real and legitimate. The question is, and I think we each have to ask each other, what is your line? Like, where, where, where is it like, okay, now I'm done, now I'm gonna stand up. But I agree, like, with, we, the only way is to come together, but the, the good guys are quiet. The others are so loud. Yes. So I get it. What do we? And, and as, as very vocal minority. Yeah. As, as Christians, Eric, I mean, it does come back to education, right? Because we we are constantly in this discipleship process. We we're trying to change. Like we believe mm -hmm. in council culture, but we oppose oppose this this cancel this cancel culture. But eventually, it's fundamentally un-American. It's it fundamentally un-American, and we won't be able to fight back if we're silent now. Mm -hmm. Kirk, real quick. This is personal for you, the education issue, deeply mm. personal. For all of us, we all have children, obviously. But homeschooling, you've been a big advocate for it. You've made a film about it, which we have shown here on TBN. Um, could homeschooling be one potential answer? People are pulling their kids out of public schools, understandably so. Sometimes a family can't afford Christian school. Um, the homeschooling option, you've been passionate about it. Tell us more about it. I'm a big advocate for home education, but e even more than what people think of as home education is just parent-directed, all-in leadership for the education of their kids. Whether that looks like a private school, you might have a great public school in your area with teachers who are representing your values. Um, I don't think it'll stay that way for long, or maybe it's a homeschool situation like we did with our kids. Um, six kids, by the way. Si yeah, six, six kids. Uh, but what I do know is that there's likely no greater responsibility or sacred duty we have as parents 
than to train up our children, to educate them, nourish them in the principles that will lead to their blessing and their protection. And then, um, by consequence, the health of the nation. I, I really do think that all of the problems of the nation, this might be painting with too broad of a brush, feel to me like it all comes back down to parenting. Because the people who are making decisions in these places of, of extreme leadership and power were little boys and girls in someone's home at one point. And if the family falls apart and the church falls apart and we're weak at these levels because we're distracted or we're busy or we're whatever, afraid, what then will we expect if we let others educate our children to become little Marxist lemmings and uh, just bow down to the God of the state? Mm -hmm. Kirk, great point. We want to get into the gender madness, but real quick, Pastor Sam, uh, I'm coming from Philadelphia. We've talked about we're both Pennsylvania natives. You're coming to the Bethlehem area, areas that have fatherlessness. Mm. And that seems to be one of the big issues in terms of the collapse, the, the moral rot, frankly, we're seeing in our country, a lack of fathers in the homes. I know you've encountered this over the years in your work. Indeed, in urban centers, but now yeah. even in rural areas and even in suburbia America, yeah. it's fatherlessness. Every single major social metric regarding poverty, education, uh, drug abuse, and so forth, can be held back. The quintessential firewall mm. is the presence of dad in the home. Mm. Not mm. just dad, but a loving, caring, yes. compassionate dad who is willing to instill values to the next generation. Mm. We can solve the vast majority of the social melees in America by engaging and empowering men to be dads. Yes. Yeah. Can, is that too controversial? Can, too can men be men? Is it, and... That's holy masculinity. <laughs> And masculinity, that toxic, that's toxic, that toxic, toxic. holy masculinity yes. is a great thing, a powerful reality. Amen. Mm. Well, speaking of masculinity, gender, let's take a look right now to short vignette on the gender madness that has gripped our nation. Take a look. Swimmer Riley Gaines is launching a new center at the Leadership Institute to fight the harm to women's sports that comes from trans men participating alongside women. We need more people willing to take a firm stance if we want to stop this. It's just unbelievable to me that these entities would think it's okay to invade the privacy or security of a woman or a girl in a shower for a locker room. I think it's aptly called this segment, guys, gender madness. This is insanity that you have me. I'm six foot four. Can I go and play girls basketball or, or play softball? I, and But that's the point we are at in America right now. Sage, I know you've spoken out a lot about this, caught some flack for it, but you were speaking the truth, quite frankly. What's your thought on this? Having worked at ESPN, of course, and you've seen this up close covering sports full time, uh, what's your begging, take on this trend? Begging my employers to at least discuss the story with Leah Thomas before Riley Gaines, lovely young woman, by the way, yeah. uh, began to speak out. And then I saw Riley doing it at 23 years old, mm. 22, 23, and her courage inspired me. To me, um, you know, it, this didn't was, wasn't a thing a couple years ago. Where, where did this come from? The timing to me is fascinating. I don't have answers on that, but it does, it was the last few years, and you think about COVID and the pandemic and George Floyd and and so much fear to be honest and be yourself. And if you say this, then you're a racist. And now if I support women, which I am one, and I have daughters, and I've been no. supporting women on the sports level for 30 years, a voice for it. And if I stand up for women now, then I'm anti-trans. I'm a transphobe. I'm called that daily on X, on Twitter. This is evil. To me, this is much bigger than just a trend or a phase or people trying to get clicks. There's evil in this? That's the right word. It is. There's, There's no, no gray other area here. Mm -hmm. We're trying to, to convince battle. children that they're not what they are, frankly, mm. um, to encourage them to be something else, to, I mean, what we're doing, the manipulation of, of bodies, their souls, like th this is the biggest, one of the biggest things I think that I've ever witnessed. Um, and you talk about speaking up. Mm. It truly is now or never. This is an entire generation yes. of children the only way to explain something this disturbing is evil. Pure mm -hmm. evil. I, I heard someone say recently, there's a lot of millstones out there for people corrupting little ones. Johnny, you're a reverend. Pastor Sam, obviously you're a pastor. This is obviously a growing topic. As Sage said, in the past few years, it's exploded onto the national consciousness, the trans issue and the transing of little kids. How do you approach this from the pulpit? How, how do Christians approach this? How can we approach this, Johnny and then Pastor Sam? 
the, the first thing we need is a, is a courage revival in the church. I mean, we need, we need people standing in the pulpits week in and week out saying the truth and saying it's okay to believe in the truth. And, and for some reason, we live in this, in this Christianity these days where we, we expect that because we follow Jesus, maybe because there are two billion or so Christians around the world that we're gonna be popular, accepted, all of these things. Th that's, that's not part of the deal. Mm -hmm. the, the deal is our savior was crucified by the Romans for his, for his belief. From the very, very beginning, we're, we're signing up to, to be strangers in this, in this world. And we need to stop teaching our children and our teenagers and our adults in our pulpits that by following Jesus, it's, it's gonna be some, you're gonna be a, you know, popular when you walk down the streets. That's not our job. Our job is to tell the truth. And we need a courage revival beginning in the mm. pulpits and God will take care of the rest. Amen. Pastor Sam? Preach the truth in and out of season. Faith and science. science. We are seeing the, the merger. I'm a faith and science guy. And I love the fact that faith and science are coming together. Yeah, the two aren't mutually exclusive. No, no, they're, they're part of the same continuum of divine wisdom, without a doubt. So all we have to do is just preach the truth. Genesis, God created man and women. But speak it with love, of course, no, no, no hatred, no animosity, uh, no adversarial spirit, with love, but preach it, teach it. Here's my message from California's pulpit. Get your hands off our children. Yes. Just get Amen. your hands off our kids. Mm. And I'm sorry, let's yep. go nuclear. Let's just sue. Let's just sue. Let's litigate. Anyone who is indoctrinating children, we're mutilating kids, you reference, mm. for crying out loud. Yes. How can we be quiet about this? Yes. I mean, permanently damaging human beings created in the image of God. So we demonstrate yes. great empathy for those young men and women who are struggling with gender dysphoria but we have to stand up for such a time as this. Amen. Sammy, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And while we need to have compassion, I know people personally who are struggling with these things and they're trying to put together a broken self in ways that make them feel whole and they can't talk to their parents and, and the church is, is full of hypocrites in their world. And, and yet in the end, I know that there are greater evils at play that are exploiting these issues and these vulnerable children to drive a wedge between parents and kids and break apart the family yeah. Yeah. and deconstruct reality and our supports for society, specifically the church and the family. Yes, faith, family, freedom. Hey, the great thing, folks, is number one, we've got four truth tellers mm -hmm. on this panel, as you can tell already. Secondly, before we are done here, we will share solutions on the way forward. But up, for, up next, much more with our panel, including the crisis at our southern border. Is it dereliction of duty on the part of our leaders? And will the 2024 election leave America hopelessly divided? We'll dig deeper with our panel after the break. We are told today that our nation is hopelessly divided. We can't have a country in disarray and a world on fire. And with your help, we're going to bring back our nation. Democracy is on the ballot. Well, you may have heard there's a presidential election here in the United States this year, 2024. It promises no doubt to be very contentious. So is the United States hopelessly divided, is there any way back or are the polar opposites just too polar? Is there any coming back together for Americans? We're joined, of course, by our all-star panel here on State of the Nation, Pastor Sammy Rodriguez, Kirk Cameron, Johnny Moore, and Sage Steele. Uh, election year, and, and it seems like we're still recovering from 2020 in many ways. Pastor Sam, I wanna start with you. Uh, as someone who worked closely with the former president, President Trump, he will likely be the nominee here in 2024, it looks like as well. Uh, where do you see this heading? I think a lot of people came into 2024 with a sense of dread, like, oh man, when the ball dropped, what's this year going to bring? Do you see this taking an even more acrimonious turn, I hate to say, as the year goes on? The amount of tension in the room, overwhelming. Rematch from 2020. Yeah. Trump versus Biden, I argue the number one issue may surprise you. It will not be the economy. It will be immigration. Yes. Wow. 12 million, 8.1 million as of today, projected 12 million by election time. 
12 million illegal entries. In the last three years alone? Under the Biden administration. 12 million. That's like more than Ohio. Yeah. 12 million. Terrorists, we have no idea how many pedophiles. Uh, fentanyl, uh, cartel members, 12 million. Are you kidding me? We are what we tolerate. You talk about lawlessness? We're permitting 12 million people to come in illegally, and you're asking me to respect the rule of law in California, to obey the traffic laws, to pay my taxes, mm. yet 12 million people are coming in illegally? What message are we conveying to our children? And you have to think the likes of terror groups as well, the terror threat you oh. mentioned, Pastor Sam, their eyes must be lighting up. It's an easy pass to enter the United States. And uh, Johnny, this issue from, there's many aspects to the border issue, obviously, but just from a strictly security issue, it seems like it puts our nation in a very vulnerable place, especially at a time of, as we've discussed, rising crime and lawlessness nationwide, including even in small towns. Uh, this, this isn't a theory. Like, the U.S. government keeps very, very specific details even when it comes to, to these uh, illegal entries. And uh, people aren't paying attention to it. It's published all the time. But there have been uh, something like five times um, the number of people that have crossed our border that were known terrorists, that were on known terrorist lists. Uh, we, we've had over 700 uh, Yemenite immigrants uh, come into the United States, a number of them Houthis, the same Iranian-backed terrorist group firing rockets into the into the Red Sea. Right At now. U.S. destroyers right now in the Red Sea. It, exactly. And then I, I think if you, if you sat down over any meal, Christmas or Thanksgiving, and you started talking about human trafficking, and er, everyone you know, around the table starts, says, their heart just grease for these young people that are trafficked in these horrible places all around the world and these terrible, terrible things, yeah. they live, you and I, all of us, we live in the country, in the world, most responsible presently for the trafficking of children. That's the reality of the situation, just because we won't close our southern border. It's not that we can't solve this problem. We're just choosing not to do it. Yeah. And I'm afraid we're going to learn a really, really tough lesson because it's impossible to catch everyone. Mm -hmm. And Johnny, you echo what Pastor Sam said. This is a choice. Yes. I mean, this is a choice from our uh, leadership. I think the empathy part is where they were so smart. And it's, oh, these, these poor people who are coming from Mexico, from other countries, and, you know, women and children and families. And, yeah. and they, they did a great job at that part um, and left out a lot of the facts. And there's a lot of people who choose to not go too deep politically and leave just, okay, bullet point surface level. And I guess that was smart because it worked and, and, until it doesn't. And then you have, and I live in the Northeast, mm -hmm. so then you have, you know, the governors and mayors in New York and Massachusetts and Chicago, and what are you doing, Texas? What are you doing? And then, you know, this is evil, and this is just yeah. against humanity. And, and, and look how it's flipped now, and all of a sudden the, the leaders in those cities are panicked because they're shutting down schools to house illegals. To me, once again, the only way to fix that, it, it is sad. We can't fix everything or everyone, though we obviously right now can't even take care of our own country. So along with having empathy for that, um, I, maybe it just takes everyone realizing our government has proven that they don't care about us, that they don't care about the taxpaying citizens who are here every day, who are happy to help in many ways. I think we all give in many ways, but when you look at the facts and 12 million people during the Biden administration I fly all the time. I know you guys, when I go through TSA, if I don't have all my forms of identification with me, I'm not getting on that plane. No. All of a sudden we have illegals, the, that word that we tend to forget, illegal, against the law, with a plane ticket, no name, let them on. The double standards where we're paying for their healthcare, their education, not our veterans. So until we take this personally and say, oh, no, no, this is actually against me, not just trying to, this is against me and my family, what I'm doing, then, we, we have no choice but to speak up based on that. And, and it's not pro-immigration. I mean, that, that's what drives me crazy. Like, yeah. all of us support immigration for the neediest people around the world. We want to welcome those people in our country. Legally. The, pro the, Legally. Prob Legally. the problem Legally. is, the problem is because of this, this current situation we're in, only the wrong people are getting in, mm -hmm. or the right people that are getting in are, aren't getting the, the, support, the support that they need. But they want this yeah. because what happens? Then the left does what? Here's a ballot, here's a ballot. Yeah. They That's want them to be dependent, and they're gonna That's win with it, that. It's reprehensible. I, yeah. I would argue it's, is this premeditated? it's diabolical. 100%. Yeah. I, I've been there for, from the Obama administration, yeah. 
with the Trump, even with Bush for four years, mm -hmm. and I've had this conversation now for X number of years. It's, it's diabolical. We are, it's not about compassion and, and empathy. Yeah. It's about people as political ploys to maintain power. Yep. Yes. It's yep. the Democratic Party, liberals attempting to maintain their base. That's, that's the objective. How dare you? Little kids being trafficked across the border, little yeah. girls being raped, and everyone's just going like, well, it is what it is. No. This is, un we don't have to accept this. And Kirk, you live in a border state, obviously, California. You've studied in such an in-depth manner our founders and the founding of this nation. This is something our founders would never countenance. What do you guys think about this? I, 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 I agree with you, Sage, when you say like, you know, we, we have a government that's not looking out for our best interest. Sometimes, I sit down for one of my favorite pizza places, and I sit down and I, I spread out my American flag, and I got my constitution there, and I, and I read it over some pizza, and people think I'm crazy, whatever. <laughs> but I'm thinking, we need to do this some more. And, and what it says right there is that we live in a very special kind of a country where I can't really point at the government because the government is us. We are the sovereign of this country, but we've been uh, brainwashed yes. to think like other countries, well, especially as Christians, obey the powers that be, Romans 13, mm -hmm. I need to obey the king and the laws. But wait a second, we're actually the kings. That's what citizens means. We're not subjects in a kingdom ruled by a king. We're citizens, meaning we are co-kings of this constitutional republic founded on biblical principles, which only works on a foundation of the gospel. And all of this is happening on my watch. Mm -hmm. If my marriage falls apart, I have to take responsibility in this. And if my house has fallen down, I can't point to the termites. These are things that I've been called to contend with. And so I say, I have to look in the mirror and say, Kirk, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you just pointing fingers and playing the blame game? Or do you say, all right, I can't do everything, but I can do something. And I want to talk with other people. And together, we can do a lot. I think all of you are expressing the sentiments of millions upon millions of people around, not only in America, around the world, frankly, uh, who are watching right now. Okay, when we talk about solutions, one solution in America historically would be, well, let's vote the bums out. We're going to, we're heading to the ballots and we're gonna vote a certain way. A uh, lot of controversy about our elections, certainly, to say the least, over the past few years. 2024 is upon us, hard to believe. Another presidential election looks like it may be a rematch, Trump, a Biden. Can we get uh, a political reality by the end of 2024, perhaps, that puts us in a better place? I just don't Anyone? trust that. I don't trust that who I vote for is actually going to be tallied. Wow. I don't yeah. trust the elections. I don't think there's nearly enough discussion about what happened in 2020. I don't care who care who wins. Well, you'll be canceled care. if you do that. Yes. Right. It's okay. <laughs> Been there, done that. At the end of the yeah. day, I don't trust the process anymore. Yeah. And that's the scariest thing. So is there hope? Because I'm kind of a glass half full person with everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's hope. But when I don't trust the system anymore, there's so much proof that we, not we, but the mainstream media, of course, yeah. chose to ignore. How do we how do we trust that when we go and take that responsibility and vote them out or vote whoever in? that it's actually gonna be an honest election. I think, Sage, a lot of people feel that way. Johnny, you've worked in Washington, D.C. circles, uh, DC circles long time. Pastor Sam, successive administrations uh, you've advised. Do you get a sense in America that people are saying, man, when they look at 2024 and just future elections in general, that they have the feeling that Sage has, where they say, you know, our confidence in the system is lost. This system is broken, and will my vote really count or even be counted at all? election integrity, election accountability. And I understand it's not pessimism. You're being actually truly realistic based on the outcome of 2020 and prior elections. Mm -hmm. But we must all, every single Christian, every single person who embraces the Judeo-Christian value system, we must be politically engaged. Yes. Uh, political activism may be replaced by prophetic activism. Mm -hmm. That's your vote. Your vote is an extension of your faith. Yeah. So we must. And I do believe things can turn around. Mm -hmm. I truly do. We can build a firewall against this crazy ludicrousy yeah. of there is no such thing as gender or science or faith, secular totalitarianism on steroids, no socialism borders. and communism, yeah. no borders. Mm -hmm. We can build a firewall. Let's yeah. call it two words, common sense. Mm -hmm. America comes back to common sense. No extremes, just common sense. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, 
but it will require every complacent, Bible-believing follower of Christ to wake up mm -hmm. and do something because we are what we tolerate. Yeah, yep. times yep. where common sense is not so common. We live in right now, Reverend Johnny Moore. Uh, you've been so engaged in this nation, around the world. I think Pastor Sammy touches on something. How can our personal activism, you can be a one, a one person activist movement on your own. Uh, you've seen this time and time again, where some smaller voices have risen up and made a massive impact. You've seen that around the world in all the great work you've done. Is that groundswell possible here in the United States? Oh, of course it is. I mean, this is the power of this country. And by the way, it's the power of being an American. You know, I, I always talk about um, my, my passport is a ticket. It's a key to solving any issue around the world because I'm an American. I can get on an airplane, I can go to a place, I can meet with people, but, but also it's a change in mentality of Americans within the United States. It's, yes, turnout is important. Every one of us voted every single election and we need to vote every single one of us because of yeah. all, everything else going on. But, but, the reason why we're in the mess every four years or every two years that we're in is because we're not involved in between. Right. And we only care about Good. presidential elections or senatorial elections or, or, or house elections. There are like 5,000 elections in the United States of America. Like you need to be running for the school board. You, need, you, you should be so incredibly embarrassed if you go in to vote and you don't know the name of the policies of every single person on that ballot, all the way down to the job you didn't even know exist and you still don't even know what it means. Like if you just get involved in the process, you can turn, you can turn this ship. Your member of Congress, okay? Your mayor in your city ought to know your name. They ought to know your name every time they do something good, and they sure as anything ought to know it every time they do something bad. Yeah, Kirk, we have about a minute left before the break. You've seen this up close. You talked about it earlier, public libraries across the United States. I think we've seen this activism at school boards. This has been amazing to see. It probably swung the election in Virginia a few years ago mm -hmm. uh, for Glenn Youngkin, but Kirk, what have you seen uh, in the encounters you've had with parents have you seen uh, a renewed activism where people are saying, as we've said, hey, enough is enough, and they work for us, and it's time to do something about it? I have seen that. I've seen people going back to first principles. I see pastors getting engaged and actually talking about the kinds of things that the, that the congregation wants them to talk about. Um, I've seen parents standing up at school board meetings, and the most impressive to me was parents who stopped shouting at the school board members who seem to be committed to a certain ideology or they themselves have been scared into a corner yeah. by those who are giving them their job. And they turn to the other parents who are sitting behind them and say, guys, this really isn't about them. This is about us. Yeah. Why are you still bringing your children to this school and dropping them off seven hours a day so that they can teach them to hate your family values, your country and your God? And by the way, you're also paying their salaries to do it with your tax dollars. Yeah. And this is starting to wake people up. People like Sammy saying these types of things, get your hands off of our kids. I, I think we're waking up to the reality. It's like we've been drugged with this comfort and with this prosperity and government will take care of everything. And it's my Cuban neighbors, it's my Russian neighbors, it's my other neighbors at church who say, don't you see, don't you see? We escape from all this stuff. Right. We feel like we're watching a bad movie. We know how it ends and you guys are like asleep. Yeah, yes. Uh, you know, know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid though that they're not gonna have those deep conversations until after it's too late, Yeah. which yeah. is in a couple of months. Do you know what I mean? Like this has to happen now before, and before there is then craziness at election time, potentially you hear th people saying there's gonna be a civil war if it goes down again. This has to happen today not in November after yeah. the election. And that's exactly why we're having this conversation. Johnny, hold that thought, hold that thought. Right after break, we're coming back with a global breakdown with our panel. Israel is at war with Iran-backed terrorists while China and Russia are on the march. Are we on the verge of a new world war? And is revival, a national turning back to God, America's only hope for survival? We'll break it down next. Hamas has shown itself to be an enemy of civilization. 
the butchering of entire families, the beheadings, the kidnappings. We must stand against evil. What happens in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. Welcome back to the State of the Nation 2024, an all-star panel. Pastor Sammy Rodriguez, Kirk Cameron, Johnny Moore, Sage Steele. Uh, guys, I don't know about you, but on the morning of October 7th, I awoke to the news of the carnage in Israel, Hamas terrorists butchering some 1,200 Israelis, mostly women and children. Now Israel is at war with Iran-backed terrorists, who, by the way, consider America the great Satan. Israel, in their ideology, is only the little Satan. Their words, not mine. Johnny, you just returned from Israel. I'm heading over shortly. And you told me off camera that it's a different nation. Uh, what is the climate on the ground in the land of Israel right now in the midst of this war and after this heinous attack? It, you have to go back to October 7th. When I woke up that morning, I, I felt exactly like you did. I, I, first of all, I didn't think it was real. I, I saw the, the video from the prime minister. I thought it was a deep fake. I thought some Iranian, yeah. some organization was trying to, trying to trick the world. And yet as the day went on and as the days went on and the weeks went on, it, it, just, got, it just got worse and worse. Yeah. And what you have to understand to understand what's happening in Israel now is this was the single worst massacre of the Jewish people since the Holocaust, okay? But what they did, and we have to say this again and again and again, is they took the most vulnerable people and they did the most horrific things to them. They put babies in ovens. They, they, com they committed every unmentionable thing you can imagine to every woman you can imagine. I met an 84-year-old woman who survived October 7th only to have on October 8th a rocket fall in her house. This was a Holocaust survivor. And you, you're seeing history unfold your, in front of your eyes. And when, you, when you're sitting down with your kids and you tell them about the Holocaust and you ask the question, like, what would I have done had I been alive when the Holocaust happened? Mm -hmm. Well, what's happening right now in the Middle East is that, okay? You have to answer that question right now. And what I can tell you from my experience on the ground, sitting with people being on the, on the right, right at Gaza in the north, looking over into Lebanon where, where Hezbollah is, is it is a hundred times worse what they did on October 7th than you have even seen. And the state of Israel isn't just fighting for its existence, it's fighting for all of these values that we're all discussing here because this country was founded on Judeo-Christian values. It's not just their war, it's our war. It seems to me that Israel, which is the size of the state of New Jersey, by the way, is the first line of defense for, as you said, Johnny, for the West. Uh, Pastor Sam, why should Americans care? You know, I mean, Israel at war right now, obviously a great ally, land of the Bible, many ties on many levels between the U.S. and Israel. Why should an American staring across the water right now, seeing what unfold on October 7th and the aftermath, why should we care? Haman, Hitler, Hamas, the continuum of hatred, anti-Semitism, arguably began in our debacle in Afghanistan during the Biden administration. Weakness attracts mm. adversity. Mm. Joe Biden is not responsible for October 7th, but Joe Biden is responsible for, in a de facto way, empowering Hamas, Iran, funding Hamas to take the steps they actually took. The question is, if another president, President Trump, if he would have been in the White House, would Iran and Hamas be so outrageously committed to doing what they did? That's a question that only time can answer in the presence of God. It's our weakness. Weakness attracts adversity. Why should Americans care? What happens in the Middle East will impact us. The fact that these terrorists are now emboldened to attack us, the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea, uh, commercial shipping, what's happening in commerce and trade around the world, because we are empowering them through our weakness. We are weak right now. I just stated that. America is weak under the current administration, that weakness will continue to attract adversity. That's why we should care. Pastor Sam, great point. There's an old saying that weak men create hard times. Mm -hmm. And Sage, when you look at China right now, by the way, and you look at Russia, and you have to think they stare across the water at the United States right now, and perhaps they see a paper tiger. Well, that's been my fear this whole time for not being an expert on the Middle East or sure. too much going on across the pond. I mean, as, it, as an American citizen, I watch that. And even though I think 
not everybody um, who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 agreed with everything that he did during his presidency. I think that's probably fair to say. What I did feel was that he cared. He cared about Americans. He cared about fairness and doing things the right way when it comes to foreign policy. I felt safer. I'm an army kid. I lived in these different countries. I lived all over the world and, and on military bases. And I also, speaking, when I go to the Army-Navy game every year with my father, I speak with troops and these young kids who are about to be soldiers and represent our country. And when you don't have a leader, we know what happens. We have seen what happens. And to me, I have been fearful, not because of my dislike for Joe Biden, because at the end of the day, whoever is elected, hopefully fairly, I will support because that's our country. But this has been the worst three, four years in, in my life, and I'm over 50, I'm 51 now, right? Because the weakness has been just glaring. And I was able, and then I'll be quiet, I interviewed Joe Biden about two months after he was elected. Um, since then, he's declined, I mean, mentally in yeah. so many ways, it's been heartbreaking to watch. Even then, in my interview, in the commercial break before, I was scared, scared to do the interview, right? Who, talking about nothing important, but based on what, as, as the commander in chief and the leader of the free world. So absolutely I've been scared for, for reasons that are so much bigger than me and my family because what happens in America has a ripple effect everywhere. He, he shouldn't be there. He, he, he needs to go for the sake of our country, not for anything that he stands for or did or didn't do. It's about the safety of others as well. I don't know. Yeah, as commander in chief. Johnny, I want to ask you about China real quick. In about a minute, uh, I know we could talk a lot longer than that about this, but the Chinese Communist Party, to get an idea of the strong men that are aligned against us, the Chinese Communist Party has directly targeted you. Mm. Talk about that and what it says about our enemies and their global ambitions and their ambition to knock us. Uh, out of that top rung. Yeah, I mean, it, it's true. I, I woke up one, one morning in May 2021, Joe Biden's president, and uh, the U.S. government had sanctioned someone, and for whatever reason, the, the foreign ministry of China decided that I was the retaliatory sanction. I wake up as a Amer regular American citizen in my home in Virginia, and the spokesperson for the foreign ministry of China said my name and sanctioned me on behalf of that big, powerful, powerful country. And... You know, I, I'm not sure why, except for one thing. I relentlessly, as an everyday American, raised my voice against the persecution of Christians in China, against the persecution of other religious communities in China, and I guess it made them afraid. And let me yeah. tell you, Eric, like, I don't know if, if we end up in World War III, but this is how you get there. Mm. The Communist Party of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, multiple wars all around the world. We don't have time for weakness, whoever's sitting in the White House. It needs to change now. Yeah, I call that the Gathering Storm Coalition, Johnny. And by the way, wear that sanction as a badge of honor from the Chinese Communist Party. Because you're hey, speaking the truth, and when people speak the truth, amen. what happens? And leave all the consequences to God. You're doing the right thing. Solutions, revival, take a look. The revival here at Asbury is now in its sixth night as hundreds of people have come from near and far to just enjoy the presence of God. This is a historical night when God has poured out revival on the United States of America. Uh, folks, by the way, if you like this conversation, you want to hear more on, we're going to expand on a bunch of topics after the show over time on TBN's Facebook channel. Check it out. But up first, Kirk Cameron. We've seen stirrings of revival as we talk about solutions. Ultimately, no matter where the political winds blow, this is a spiritual battle. I think you guys have laid it out so eloquently tonight. But Kirk, when we're talking solutions, are these stirrings of revival we've seen in 2023? How encouraging was this to you? We saw the film Jesus Revolution. We saw mass baptisms in California. We saw the Asbury Revolution. Do you see something special happening here? I'm, I'm very interested in revival. I do think revival or bust is a good way to uh, characterize the time that we're in right now. Um, I, I, I'm always hesitant when I see revivals uh, happening here and there. I'm hopeful, but I'm hesitant because I want them to be so much more than just Jesus goosebumps that yeah. last a while. I want these to be mountains of faith and, and systemic, holistic change 
that have to begin in the heart of people. And real revivals begin with repentance. Mm. It doesn't begin with um, a, a president in the White House or the closing of a border and, and the an economic change. I know all those things are super important, but these, I think, are the fruit. And what needs to be addressed is the root. And if we've cut off the tap root that produces all the blessing that we've, produ- we've enjoyed for so long, we've got to reattach the root or everything's gonna fall apart. I think it is revival or bust. And um, historically, I'm encouraged to see that real revivals seem to happen at times of political corruption, spiritual apathy, moral decline, uh, and about at every 50 year period. I think we're there. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really hoping and praying that we get to see revival. I wanna be at the heart of it. Amen. And Pastor Sam, it seems very biblical. As Kirk just mentioned, when the nation of Israel, biblically, the Israelites, tough times, they cried out to God, help us, uh, is revival, is a turning back to God, is that the key here? And how do we make that happen? We can't force people, obviously, to, to worship the Lord, but how can we get in that place where Americans are saying, you know what, we're at the breaking point, enough's enough, God, we need you, we want to do it your way and not our way. Yeah, America doesn't want revival. America needs revival. It's a matter of necessity. We have to be fully cognizant of the fact that relativism leads to perversion. We are at that tipping point in America, Mm -hmm. a mighty move of God, a sovereign move of God that is repentance that leads to cultural reformation. Yep. So it's not about just church growth. Yeah. And how many attend my service on Sunday? And how many follow me on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube? It's about the glory of Jesus in every aspect of society. Yes. That's what it means. I'm so Cultural happy to hear you Cultural reformation, say that. societal transformation, not just church metrics. Let's change the world. That's revival in the name of Jesus. It begins with 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, called by my name, humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then God will heal our parents. I'm so glad that you said that. If I could just jump in. Sure. I'm so glad that you are pro revival, not just pro removal. I meet up so many Christians who are going like, Lord, let's just skip revival and all the hard work of evangelism, discipleship, transformation of culture. Just beam me up, get me out of here. And I wanna say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The victory of the gospel throughout the ages has been a great testimony to the power of the kingdom of God on earth. And we should be encouraged by people who have gone through extremely difficult times. We have the word, we have the spirit, we have the truth, we have the people, we have family, we have the church, we have so much, we have this right here, right now. Why can't we do what the pilgrims did in a wilderness with no money, no guns, no influence, no ability to do anything, and they create the greatest nation on earth. They give us the Mayflower Compact leading to the Constitution. Do we not have the ability and the resources to turn this nation's direction back around? I think we do. Careful what you ask for, because revival is uncomfortable. Yes. Revival is not like, woo! It's a sanctifying fire. It's a purifying fire. And it begins with God's people. And it works its way out towards government and society. That's right. Be careful what you ask for when you ask for revival. Good point, Pastor. It demands acknowledgement of national sins. It demands repentance, Johnny. And it seems like we're getting to the point where, hey, Americans might have seen enough and, and man, we're ready, we're ready for a change. And hopefully that change is Jesus. You know, a lot of people have thanked, in the church, have thanked God for certain uh, cultural things that have happened in the United States of America. But I think they have been a reminder to us of how far we had gone without God. And I mean, what, what Kirk and Sam have said here is so important because it begins in our individual hearts. It's not like waiting for something to happen in some church service or somebody down the block or where's the elderly woman that prays, you know, all day, every day. It's you. It's you. Like everybody watching us like right now can just cut off the television when this is over and get on your face and search your heart and beg and plead. And then God does the work. You know, one one of my favorite verses in the the New Testament is um, when the Apostle Paul is in prison and he's sort of at the end of his life and he's writing a letter to his uh, protege. And he says, I send greetings from all the believers, including those in Caesar's household. Yeah. And we've seen a lot of political achievements that make people very, very proud. Mm-hmm. When was the last time you heard the story about a revival taking place in yeah. Congress, in the White House, Amen. in the Fortune 500 company? Where you have a heart out here, guys. We have to wrap Sage in about 20 seconds, optimistic about the future. 
yes, my father raised us on this from West Point, the cadet prayer. Help us to choose the harder right instead of the easier wrong and to never be content with a half truth when the whole can be one. Amen. Harder right, easier wrong, and the fear. We have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. But yes, get on your knees for those in our family and friends that don't. Harder right. Yes. Harder right. What a way to close. Sage Steele, truer words never spoken for Sage Steele, Johnny Moore, Kirk Cameron, Sammy Rodriguez. Join us on TBN's Facebook page. God bless. We'll see you again soon.